Greetings, comrade stashes. I send you revolutionary greetings. Is that a bit much? Give me a favor, please. Get out of here. Get out of here! Yeah, I think that's a bit much. Well, last week we looked at the lead up to the 1917 February Revolution, as well as the overthrow of the Russian Emperor or Tsar. Today we are going to look at the mother of all revolutions, the second 1917 revolution, more commonly known as the October Revolution or the Bolshevik Revolution. So let's go. On the 23rd of October 1917, the Bolshevik Central Committee voted 10 to 2 for a resolution saying that an armed uprising is inevitable and that the time for it is fully ripe. At the committee meeting, Lenin discussed how the people of Russia had waited long enough for an armed uprising and it was the Bolsheviks' time to take power. The Bolsheviks created a revolutionary military committee within the Petrograd Soviet led by the Soviet's president, Leon Trotsky. The Revolutionary Military Committee included armed workers, sailors and soldiers. The committee methodically planned to occupy strategic locations throughout the city. The conditions were ripe for another revolution. All it needed was a spark. That spark came on the 6th of November, when a group of soldiers loyal to Kerensky's government marched into the printing house of the Bolshevik newspaper, Bochi Put, or Worker's Path, and seized and destroyed printing equipment and thousands of newspapers. In response, the Bolshevik Military Revolutionary Committee issued a statement denouncing the government's actions and Bolshevik Alliance soldiers retook the Robochi Put printing house. Kerensky responded by ordering the raising of all except one of Petrograd's bridges a fear tactic aimed at discouraging the Bolsheviks from carrying on the fight. What followed was a series of sporadic clashes over control of the bridges between militias aligned with the Military Revolutionary Committee and army units still loyal to the government. On the 7th of November 1917, the Bolsheviks initiated a large-scale uprising in Petrograd against the provisional government. Then, to the dismay of the government forces, a pro-Bolshevik flotilla of ships from the Russian Navy were parked off the Petrograd harbour ready to support the uprising. Bolshevik forces systematically captured major government facilities, key communication installations and vantage points with little opposition. The provisional government was virtually helpless to offer any sort of resistance. Railways and railway stations had been controlled by Soviet workers and soldiers for days, making rail travel to and from Petrograd impossible for provisional government officials. However, Kerensky was able to somehow escape the blockades and flee the city. Meanwhile, Meanwhile a final assault against the seat of government at the Winter Palace took place without much resistance from the soldiers stationed there. While the cabinet of the provisional government within the palace debated what action to take, Bolsheviks issued an ultimatum to surrender. In the early hours of the 8th of November, Bolshevik forces gained control of the Winter Palace and the cabinet of the provisional government surrendered before being arrested and imprisoned. The only member who was not arrested was Kerensky himself. The Petrograd Soviet now controlled the government, the garrison and the proletariat. So the second All-Russian Congress of Soviets held its opening session to elect a new government cabinet. But the transfer of power did not go smoothly. The center and right wings of the socialist revolutionaries, as well as the Mensheviks, believed that Lenin and his Bolsheviks had illegally seized power and they walked out before the resolution was passed. As they exited, they were taunted by Trotsky, who told them, You are pitiful, isolated individuals. You are bankrupts. Your role is played out. Go where you belong from now on, into the dustbin of history. 
pretty harsh, dude. Leon Trotsky was born on November 7, 1879 in southern Ukraine. His real name was Lev Davidovich Bronstein and he was born into a wealthy Jewish family of farmers. He was arrested in January 1898 for revolutionary activity and spent four and a half years in prison in Siberia. He escaped in 1902 using the name Trotsky, which was actually the name of his prison guard. He later adopted the name Leon Trotsky as his political pseudonym. Trotsky made his way to London, where he met another exile, Vladimir Yulinov Lenin. With the outbreak of the 1905 revolution, Trotsky returned to Russia and joined the first Soviet in St. Petersburg, where he was arrested again and deported for life to Siberia. He escaped again and began his second emigration, which took him to Vienna, Zurich, Paris and the United States, from where he traveled back to Russia in 1917 to be part of the October Revolution. On the 8th of November, the Congress elected a new cabinet of Bolsheviks. This new Soviet government was known as the Council or Soviet of People's Commissars or Sovnikom, with Lenin as a leader. Lenin allegedly approved of the name, saying that it smells of revolution. The cabinet quickly passed the decree on peace, which was to take Russia out of the First World War, and the decree on land, which called for an abolition of private property and the redistribution of the landed estates amongst the peasantry. According to the decree on land, the peasants were to seize the lands of the nobility, monasteries and the church. On the 23rd of November, the government applied the term citizens of the Russian Republic to Russians whom they sought to make equal in all possible respects by the nullification of all legal designations of civil inequality such as estates, titles and ranks. On the 25th of November, a constituent assembly was elected. In these elections, 26 mandatory delegates were proposed by the Bolshevik Central Committee and 58 were proposed by the Socialist Revolutionaries. On the 29th of December, the government ventured to eliminate all hierarchy in the army removing titles, ranks, and uniform decorations. The tradition of saluting was also eliminated. On the 2nd of January 1918, the Cheka, or Soviet secret police, was created by Lenin's decree. These were the beginnings of the Bolsheviks' consolidation of power over their political opponents. In September 1918, the so-called Red Terror began, following a failed assassination attempt on Lenin. The Red Terror was a period of political repression and mass killings carried out by the Bolsheviks, with some sources claiming that around 28,000 executions took place each year between 1918 and 1922. Another important reform was the decree on land. This approved the actions of peasants who throughout Russia had seized private land and redistributed it among themselves. The Bolsheviks viewed themselves as representing an alliance of workers and peasants. This was signified by the hammer and sickle on the new national flag and the coat of arms of the Soviet Union. Other reforms related to the land decree included all private property was nationalized by the government, all Russian banks were nationalized, private bank accounts were expropriated, the properties of the church including bank accounts were expropriated, all foreign debts were repudiated, control of the factories was given to the Soviets, and wages were fixed at higher rates than during the war, and a shorter 8-hour working day was introduced. Shorter 8-hour working day. But not all private property was nationalized by the government in the days, weeks, or even months that followed the October Revolution. The new Bolshevik government did not support the workers taking over large corporations and collectively organizing the economy. As chairman of the government, Lenin negotiated with factions of the upper bourgeoisie so that the bourgeoisie would manage the corporations according to orders from the new government. This failed utterly because it assumed the masses would accept class cooperation in a revolutionary situation. The Bolsheviks understood workers' control as checking and supervision by the employees to ensure that orders from the Bolshevik-led government were followed. 
Some factories continued in private hands because the masses either had no managerial competence or they didn't immediately pledge their support to the Bolshevik party. Other factories were taken over by the employees and some by the government after pressure from below or by governmental initiative. There was a lack of class consciousness of the masses who put their faith in an authoritarian political party such as the Bolsheviks. The Bolshevik party opposed the masses ruling the economy from below, like it opposed political institutions being ruled from below. Through democratic elections in the Soviets in 1917, the Bolshevik party built its power to control the trade unions which became state institutions. Later, the same year, the factory committees were made subordinate to trade unions. From this base, it was not difficult to establish one-man rule over the factories. One administrative and one technical manager had daily control, with the technical manager having the last word based on orders from higher up in the state. A system of appointment from above was established step by step. Local Soviets resisting the policy were either met with armed checker troops and forced to submit, or the Soviets were denied access to ration cards for food and fuel. The Bolshevik party blocked democratic elections to the Soviets, factory committees, the trade unions and other institutions. This made their transfer of power easier. The October Revolution enabled the political revolution by taking down the old regime but failed to establish a democratic system. In addition, the economy was not transferred to the masses as what had been promised. The political elite saw itself as crucial to world revolution, but prevented any power from being exerted from below. When that same elite got control of the economy, it only managed to transform itself into a ruling state capitalist class. Later, the Bolshevik party went further by placing the working class under martial law to force obedience. Bolshevik-led attempts to gain power in other parts of the Russian Empire were largely successful in Russian proper, although the fighting in Moscow lasted for two weeks. But they were less successful in ethnically non-Russian parts of the Empire, which had been seeking their independence since the February Revolution. For example, the Ukrainian Rada, which had declared autonomy on the 23rd of June 1917, created the Ukrainian People's Republic on the 20th of November, which was supported by the Ukrainian Congress of Soviets. This led to an armed conflict with the Bolshevik government and eventually a Ukrainian declaration of independence from Russia on the 25th of January 1918. On the 3rd of March 1918, Russia formally withdrew from the First World War. This happened with the signing of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk between the Bolshevik government and the Central Powers, which included the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. According to the treaty, Soviet Russia withdrew from all of Russia's previous commitments to the Allied Powers and 11 nations became independent in Eastern Europe and Western Asia. The treaty further resulted in Russia handing over control of the Baltic states which are Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, to Germany. After the success of the October Revolution transformed the Russian state into a Soviet Republic, a coalition of anti-Bolshevik groups attempted to unseat the new government in the Russian Civil War from 1918 to 1922. During this war, there were actually many factions fighting for their own reasons. But the two significant forces were the Red Army, fighting for the Bolshevik form of socialism led by Lenin, and a loosely allied hodgepodge of forces known as the White Army, which included diverse interests, favoring political monarchism, capitalism and social democracy, each with democratic and anti-democratic variants. So basically anyone who was anti-communist fought on the side of the White Army. But then you even had rival militant socialists as well as non-ideological green armies who fought against both the Reds and the Whites. 
So it looked a lot like this. Thirteen foreign nations intervened against the Red Army, most notably the Allied powers with the goal of re-establishing the Eastern Front of the First World War, which was still going on at the time. Three foreign nations of the Central Powers, including Germany, also intervened, rivaling the Allied intervention with the main goal of retaining the territory they had received in the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Eventually, the Red Army defeated the White Armed Forces of South Russia in Ukraine as well as the army led by Admiral Alexander Kolchak to the east of Siberia in 1919. The remains of the white forces were beaten in Crimea and evacuated in the late 1920. Lesser battles of the war continued on the periphery for two more years and minor skirmishes with the remnants of the white forces in the far east continued well into 1923. The war ended in 1923 in the sense that Bolshevik communist control of the newly formed Soviet Union was then assured. But armed national resistance in Central Asia was not completely crushed until 1934. An estimated 7 to 12 million casualties were recorded during the war, mostly civilians. In an attempt to intervene in the civil war after the Bolsheviks made a separate peace with the Central Powers, the Allied Powers occupied parts of the Soviet Union for over two years before finally withdrawing. The effects of the civil war resulted in strained relations between the new Soviet Russia and most Western countries. In fact, the United States didn't recognize the new Russian government until 1933. Thus, the seeds of distrust between the USA and what would become the USSR that eventually led to the most significant period of the 20th century in world history, the Cold War, was sown as a result of the Bolshevik Revolution and the subsequent Civil War. And what of the fate of Tsar Nicholas and his family? Well, after the July days, the provisional government decided to move the royal family to a safer location. So the Romanovs were taken to Tobolsk on the 19th of August 1917. There they lived in considerable comfort. When the Bolsheviks seized power, Nicholas followed the events with interest, but not yet with alarm. He continued to underestimate Lenin and the Bolshevik movement. The Romanov family still believed that various plots were underway to break them out of captivity and smuggle them to safety. They were hoping for an escape plan to smuggle them to Great Britain, where the monarch, King George V, was both Nicholas II's and Alexandra's cousin. But in reality, the Western Allies lost interest in the fate of the Romanovs after Russia left the war. The Sovnikom ordered that the royal family be moved to Yekaterinburg, with the intention of eventually bringing Nicholas to a show trial in Moscow. At Yekaterinburg, they were imprisoned in the Ipachev house, which ominously became referred to as the House of Special Purpose. Here the Romanovs were kept under even stricter conditions. Nicholas and Alexandra were later joined by their children because Alexei was previously considered unfit to travel to Yekaterinburg. By the first weeks of June 1918, the Bolsheviks were becoming alarmed by the revolt of the Czechoslovak Legion, whose forces were approaching Yekaterinburg from the east. This prompted a wave of executions and murders of those who were believed to be counter-revolutionaries, including Grand Duke Michael, who was murdered on the 13th of June 1918. Although the Bolshevik leadership in Moscow still intended to bring Nicholas to trial, the military situation deteriorated and so Leon Trotsky and Yakov Sverdlov revisited the idea. On the 16th of July, it was decided to execute the Romanovs because the Czechs were expected to reach the city imminently. In the meantime, 
the firing squad waited through the night for the signal to act. Just like with the fate of Rasputin, there are several accounts of what happened next, and historians have not agreed on a solid confirmed set of events. One version of events is from the commander of the firing squad, Yakov Rovsky. His version goes as follows. In the early hours of the 17th of July 1918, the royal family was awakened around 2 a.m. They got dressed and were led down into a basement room at the back of the Ipachev house. The family was told that they were being moved for their own safety due to the anti-Bolshevik forces approaching. Meanwhile, Yurovsky and his firing squad had been assembled and were waiting in an adjoining room. When the Romanovs arrived in the basement, Alexandra allegedly complained that there were no chairs for both her and the sickly Alexei to sit on. Yurovsky ordered two chairs brought in, and when she and Alexei were seated, the firing squad filed into the room. Yurovsky announced to the family that they were to be executed. A stunned Nicholas asked, What? What did you say? And turned towards his family. Yurovsky quickly repeated the order and Nicholas then allegedly said, You know not what you do. The executioners drew handguns and began shooting. Nicholas was the first to die. Incredibly, Anastasia, Tatiana, Olga and Maria survived the initial hail of bullets. The reason why they survived was because they each wore over 1.3 kilograms of diamonds and precious gems sewn into their clothing, which provided some protection from the bullets. But then the firing squad moved closer to stab them with bayonets before they were finally each shot in the head at close range. The bodies were burnt and destroyed before being thrown down an unused mine shaft. The following day, other members of the Romanov family were taken to another mine shaft and thrown in alive, except for the Grand Duke Sergei Mikhailovich, who was shot when he tried to resist. These bloody couple of days ended the Romanov bloodline in Russia. The Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 sent shockwaves across the globe inspiring revolutionary movements and reshaping the course of history. In the years that followed, Russia would undergo profound transformations, ultimately emerging as the world's first socialist state, the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, or the SFSR, and later it would form part of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or the USSR, or Soviet Union. But that is a story for another day. That's it for now. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Please don't forget to slap the like, share and subscribe buttons. Until next time, from Stashy and myself, stay Stashy.